Welcome to the Hyde Park Baptist Church live stream. I'm Kai Bowman, pastor here at Hyde Park Baptist and the Quarries Church. So glad that you have tuned in. I wonder where you're watching from. Are you at home here in Austin? Are you in a hotel room? Are you traveling? Maybe you're in your car and you've got your device open and you're driving down the road. And, uh, or maybe you're not even in the state of Texas. Maybe you're in one of the other wonderful states. Uh, and I would love for you to give us a shout out and let us know where you're watching from. One of the things that we find so cool is that we've got viewers from literally all over the world. Now, it changes from week to week, but there are often times when we have had as many as 16 different international locations tuning in. Well, wherever you're watching from, welcome. We're glad you're here. We love the ministry of live stream because we like being able to reach out and touch people wherever you may be today. I'm starting a brand new series today called Getting Through What You're Going Through. And would you agree with me that the last couple of years have been very, very challenging? I mean, think about it. We've had a global pandemic, right? And the economy is absolutely a disaster right now. We've got uh, uh, the issues of uh, supply chain. You've got, you know, ships backed up where they can't find trucks to come unload the ships and get the stuff to the to the retailers. Uh, the cost of diesel fuel is five dollars a gallon and more, north of five dollars, which means the truckers are having a hard time. And then you've got, you know, the issue of war in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, just the price of gas at the pump. And so we've got problems. And then you look at school shootings and violence. I mean, everywhere you turn, the news is bad. But God has good news. But we're going to look at a brand new series called Getting Through What You're Going Through because we're all going through something. But, you know, uh, God has never promised to give us an easy life. But He has promised to give us the strength to get through it. Today, I'm going to open up this series with a very unusual passage that says, Count it all joy. Whenever kind of trial, whenever kind of trouble, whenever kind of difficulty comes, count it all joy. And you say, Pastor, that's ridiculous. How can I have joy when I'm looking at all the problems in the world? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So I hope you'll stay tuned. In fact, if you know anybody that's going through a tough time right now, text them right now and tell them to jump on our live stream. If you're watching by Facebook, you have the opportunity to share this right now. I'll not explain to you how to do it. You know how to do it. But push share and let other people who are your friends see that they can join this worship service live right now via your Facebook page. And you say, why would I do that? Oh, I don't know, evangelism, ministry, caring for the lost, caring for the people that need to hear the word of God. I can think of about a thousand good reasons why you'd do it. So why don't you do that right now? And then also I want you to know that we are having uh, Lord's Supper tonight at six o'clock. We're gonna open up at six o'clock tonight uh, with a uh, little quick uh, 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 church conference, won't take very long. We've got to elect our new school board slate for the coming year, and that won't take long. But uh, if you're a church member, we want you here. And then we're going to have a Lord's Supper worship service. It's going to be great. Don't miss that if you're in town. Come on over and let's be a part of that live, okay? Then next Sunday is Father's Day, right? And we don't want anybody to miss that. And uh, we've got a special guest, uh, Ronnie Hill. Ronnie is a young evangelist. I've known him ever since he was just a young kid. He's still young, but I've known him a long time. And he's just a great guy, a rodeo rider, and just a, a, just a super good guy. And uh, he's going to come and speak on Dad's Day next Sunday. So it's going to be Father's Day. So dads, come on to church on Sunday uh, next week. All right? Well, I want us to jump into the service right now, and let's just see what God has for us. And uh, if you're watching from somewhere outside of Texas, why don't you text us and let us know where you're watching from when you share your prayer request. You can text us anytime during the service today with your prayer request at 512-481-2305. 
give us your name and if you're watching outside the state of Texas, give us your name, your prayer request and where you're watching from. That will bless us, I promise you. Also, I have a little booklet called Next Steps, which could be a blessing to you. And if you will email us at info, that's I-N-F-O, at hpbc.org, ask for the little book, Next Steps. I'll need your name and uh, your address, and we'll send you the book out this week in the mail. Okay, let's join our service live. I'll be back at the end of the service. Thanks again for being a part of the service today, and let's go in and worship God right now. guy years and years ago he said you know you can't stand on the promises if you're sitting on the premises so I, I say all that to, thank you for laughing when I say something funny because sometimes people go what yeah I got <laughs> this one is not what you think we're gonna do it's I stand amazed in the present so I do want you to stand together let's sing together Sing it, church. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned on clean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. We're so glad you chose to join us this morning in person here at Hyde Park Baptist Church or if you're watching us online, we're also glad you chose to join us. We're going to continue to worship in song in just a moment, but we're going to worship through prayer first. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come and to worship you. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for our sins and left his spirit that we might have joy, God. We thank you for the fact that we can have joy in a world of trouble. God, we pray that you'd be with Dr. Bowman as he shares the truth of that 
uh, that truth of your word with us this morning from James. God, we pray that you would speak through him and to our hearts. We pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive that word as we continue to worship in your son. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay standing. We did this Wednesday night at the prayer service. I thought we ought to do it again.
Thank you. you. may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. And I want to welcome all of our online congregation as well. Let's all join together and welcome the online family. Everybody watching by live stream, we appreciate y'all very much. And uh, want to let you know that if you have a prayer request today, whether you're here in the chapel or watching on live stream, just take out your phone right now and text us at 512-481-2305. That goes straight to our prayer team, and uh, they will be uh, sharing that prayer request with everybody on the prayer team. The staff will be praying over it this week. It is our joy to pray for you because Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And so uh, when you share your prayer request with us, whatever the prayer request may be, if you wouldn't mind, give us your name. That really helps us as we're taking in all these prayer requests. So just text us anytime during the service or anytime during the week at 512-481-2305. It's not a phone number it's a text line also if you're our guest today thank you very much thank you very much for being here we have a gift packet for you if you'll share with us a little bit about you we want to give you a gift packet we've got one in the uh out in the vestibule area and another uh, guest table out to my right to your left out this door up the steps uh slightly you'll see the welcome sign anywhere that you see the welcome sign, that's where the guest table will be. Also, if you're giving today, we appreciate it. Giving uh, sacrificially and generously is how we keep our ministries going. The offering boxes are by the entrances and exits. Obviously, you can mail it in, drop it, on the, drop it by the church office during the week, or use the church app, and you can give online, and we appreciate it very much. We want to pray today. We're starting a brand new series, Getting Through What You're Going Through. A lot of trouble in the world, and uh, God is good, and he has a lot of answers on how we can face all the difficulties that we're going through. So I want to pray for you right now. Lord, you know uh, everything that we're going through individually and as a congregation, as a city, and Lord, as a nation, and Lord, the whole world. And we are in a world of trouble. We know that. But God, you, we also know that you're right in the middle of it. You have never left us. You are never going to forsake us. You have a plan. You're working your plan with perfect faithfulness. You never say oops. And so we're going to trust you today. We're asking you to build our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship right now. Come on. of fire who is he with blinding robe who is he who stands before the great I am who is he who takes the scroll who is he who claims the throne who is he whose blood has paid the price for me the lion of the tribe of Judah has won the victory. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the one who glory falls from you, most holy, precious Son. Redeemer is your name, the sacrifice enthroned, the word of God who was, who is and needs to come. It is he Taste the sweet. 
Would you pray with me? Father, there are so many troubles, so many problems, and yet, God, through it all, we know that you're, you're faithful, you have a plan, and you want to help your people through every challenge and every trouble. Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would minister to every person in this room, that we would sense, even if our faith has been staggered during this week, or over a longer period of time, that your spirit would revive our faith today. Every person in this room 
would be aware of your presence like never before. Lord, if you'll do that, we'll have a church service like never before. God, I'm asking you to fill me with the Spirit that I might declare your word in truth and in simplicity, but with power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you ever heard the term counterintuitive? You know, counterintuitive means it appears to be one way. Common sense tells you it's one way, but reality tells you it's something different. For instance, when we look out in the morning, we say the sun rises in the east, we say it sets in the west. But that's not true. The sun does not rise in the east, and the sun does not set in the west. You say, what are you talking about? Because the sun doesn't rise, and the sun doesn't set. And the sun doesn't move from east to west. We think it looks that way. We think it rises. We think it sets because we have the impression through observation that the sun is moving around us. And the opposite is true. We're moving around it. So it's not rising. It's not setting. It's in one place. The common sense observation is one thing, but it's counterintuitive. The facts are something else. Breaking your car on ice is also a counterintuitive experience. Now, you're driving your car, you're driving 65 miles an hour on dry pavement on a sunny day in Austin, Texas, and you come around a corner and there's something right in the middle of the road, a wreck or somebody is run in front of you or there's some other kind of problem that you didn't know was happening, the first intuitive response is to step on your brake and stay on it till you get that car stopped. And that makes good sense unless you're in the middle of the winter in Fairbanks, Alaska and you're driving on solid ice and you come around that same corner and there in the middle of the road there's a wreck or something has run in front of you and if your intuition is step on that brake and hold it until you get that car stopped you will lose control of your car because once you put that brake on you start swerving around on that ice and you become a bigger problem than whoever is in front of you and the counterintuitive facts are rather than stepping on the brake tap the brake so there are a lot of things in life we could go on perhaps you have your own examples there are a lot of things in life that appear one way common sense tells you it's one thing but the truth is counterintuitive it's the opposite of what you expect I don't know if you've ever thought about it but the New Testament is full of this kind of counterintuitive truth for instance we think The way to happiness is to accumulate more and more. Jesus said, you'll actually be happier if you give than if you receive. We think that if someone strikes us, the natural response should be, hit them back. Jesus said, no. If someone strikes you on one cheek, let them strike you on the other cheek as well. We think that the way to be successful is to have a lot of people serving us. The Bible teaches the opposite. The Bible teaches that greatness is not determined by how many people serve you, but by how many people you serve. Today we're going to look at another one of those counterintuitive truths. As we look together at the subject, choosing joy in a world of trouble. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to James, the first chapter? We're in a brand new series we're starting today. And I want us to look at James chapter 1 as we look at getting through what you're going through. Lots of challenges, lots of troubles. Nobody can deny that we're living in a world full of trouble. What is counterintuitive is that we should choose joy in the midst of all that trouble. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, let's look at what the Bible says in James chapter 1. Verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I mean, right there you have counterintuitive truth. Count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds. In other words, when trouble comes at you, when difficulties arise, When hassles seem to be almost overwhelming, 
you should rejoice. <laughs> that doesn't make sense on the surface. Count it, all joys, uh, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many of you know there's a lot of trouble in the world, right? Everywhere you turn. I mean, you've got this war going on in, in Eastern Europe, and, uh, you know, it's affecting the whole world. Gas prices are out of control. Big gaps on the shelves at the grocery store. And I don't know about you, but I go to the grocery store, and you don't, I don't have to watch the news to learn that prices are going up. I just look at the things that I like to buy, and I realize, hey, what's going on here? I paid X a month ago, and now they're wanting, you know, quite a bit more of this for that same product if it's even available. Uh, and then you look around at all the problems that we're uh, encountering in the economy. Our stock market is, is tanking. If it goes up a little bit one day, you feel like, oh, praise the Lord. And then the next day, you lose all of what you gained plus a little more. And uh, we're in an inflation rate that is as bad as we've seen since 1981 that's the year Tina and I got married we've been married for over 40 years we haven't seen the kind of trouble we're looking at today in a long time where there's a whole generation of adults that have never seen the world in so many troubles as it's in right now and what is our response well typically our response is to complain criticize curse but the Bible says, no, there's a different option. The Bible says that trials and troubles and difficulties and challenges are an opportunity for us to rejoice. I love what Bruce Gore, who's a professor at Whitworth University, that school out in Washington, recently said, trials and difficulties are a reality of this life. But if we realize that there are valuable lessons that can be learned as we go through them, then we can turn a, ne a negative experience into a positive one. That's counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what we expect. That somehow or another, when we're going through challenges and difficulties, we should find the joy of the Lord rather than simply criticize, complain, and uh, curse it. So here's the truth I want us to notice this morning as we begin this new series. I wanted to begin the series on this note of joy. I want us to notice you can respond to trouble by choosing joy. You can respond to trouble by choosing joy. Now, what am I talking about? Well, look at verse 2 again. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know, I love that statement, you know, even though we get amnesia a little bit, right? We go through trouble, we forget, oh, wait a minute, God got me through this once before. Oh, wait a minute, God got me through this when I was a teenager. Wait a minute, God got me through this when I was a college student. Wait a minute, God got me through this during one of the most difficult periods of my life. God got me through this once before. Why does it seem so strange, so unique, uh, as if I've never been through anything like this before? James said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, God is actually doing something for your good during the most difficult times of your life. Now, I love what the late, great Adrian Rogers used to say, to rejoice is a choice. You've got a choice. 
And here in this passage of Scripture, James, who... You remember who James is, right? A lot of people are named James in the New Testament. It's a very common name. In fact, in the, New, in the New Testament era, a lot of people were named James. But this is not James the apostle, the brother of John. This is James the half-brother of Jesus. And this James was a skeptic during the life of Jesus, but after the resurrection, he became a believer. And this James was a very influential leader in the early church because we know from the book of Acts that he was actually the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he is writing maybe to his congregation that's been scattered. If you remember what I'm talking about, you remember that uh, Stephen in the book of Acts was stoned and after the stoning of Stephen the Bible says a great persecution arose and the people were scattered well those people that were scattered were in James's church he was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem and now he's writing to the dispersion the word dispersion means to scatter and it could be that he's writing to his own congregation and these congregational members have been scattered all over the world and the observation of the moment was these are terrible times we are men and women who lived in Jerusalem who worked in Jerusalem our families were in Jerusalem our homes were in Jerusalem our lifestyle was in Jerusalem our dreams were in Jerusalem and now we're in you know Antioch and we're down in Egypt and we're over in Turkey and and uh, we've gone up to Syria and we're scattered everywhere because of the persecutions in Jerusalem just like we've gone through a bunch of stuff global pandemic war economy in the tank problems everywhere you turn add to that my grass isn't looking too good right now there's a drought Right? And it happened pretty quick. Everywhere you look are problems. And you feel like the problems are mounting. They're becoming more and more. And he says to his congregation, what I'm saying to mine, count it all joy. Now, in one sense, to stand before a group of people, as I'm doing right now, as I will do all day today, a group of people going through every kind of challenge imaginable. And I just mentioned the kind we're all going through. Some of you are going through illness. Some of you are going through grief. Some of you are going through real problems with your family that most of us don't even know about. Some of you have other kinds of problems, even including addiction. And there are all kinds of problems that are beneath the surface that are personal only to you or to me. I'm only addressing the ones we know about. And on top of the ones we know about are the kind that are deeply seated in our own personal lives that maybe we only tell to our best friends and maybe not at all. And it is almost outrageous. I have to be absolutely certain that God has spoken or I would never in a million lifetimes stand before a group of people like you and me and all of us watching online going through all the troubles we're going through and say to you with a straight face, rejoice! Only the Spirit would lead me to say a thing like that because I'm not much different than anybody else. In fact, I don't guess I'm any different. When trouble comes, I don't feel like rejoicing. I feel like complaining. And uh, I usually do. But the Bible says complaining, criticizing, cursing, that's not the way. In fact, when trouble comes of all kinds, rejoice. Now look what he says. Count it all joy, my brothers. Count. That's a mathematical term. Reckon. Add it up. We would say this. When all the troubles that you're looking at grow around you, financial, health, societal, everywhere you look, problems. He said, the Bible says, James said, the Holy Spirit says, do the math. Do the math. 
count it up. When all these troubles surround you, consider it, reckon it, do the math, add it up, count it, all joy. You notice that little word all? (laughs) I'm going to write a book one of these days about all. It's the biggest little word in the New Testament. Problems of all kinds and count it what? All joy. Don't count some of it joy. Don't consider that, well, I'll steal a little joy out of the middle of the madness. I'll find a little bit of happiness even though everything's going crazy. Even though, even though the whole world is a dumpster fire, I'll try to warm myself on a cool day next to it. No. Count it what? All joy. When you meet <laughs> trials of various kinds. The word various, there, you could almost translate it multicolored. You ever see drapes uh, that hang in a home and there are folds in the drape, right? And that, those folds is this word in Greek. Multi, variegated, various. And it's like you got what you see, what you don't see, what you see, what you don't see, like pleats in a skirt, in the old-fashioned skirts that women used to wear in the 50s. They had all those pleats on them. I don't know if they still wear them or not. Maybe. Mostly they were jeans. I don't know. But that idea of pleats, you see part of it, you don't see all of it, then you see part of it, then part of it's hidden. It's variegated. It's variables. That's what this word various means. Multicolored. Trouble of every kind. How many of you could testify, if I were to run around with a microphone, you could stand up and testify that you're not just dealing with one trouble today. You got all kinds of trouble, right? You got family trouble, you got financial trouble, you got physical trouble, you got trouble everywhere you turn. I mean, the reality is, if it weren't for Jesus, we'd stress out. We'd get in a corner, bite our fingernails, and just stress out and die. I mean, if it weren't for Jesus, what would we do? And then the Bible gives us this advice. Rejoice. Be be filled with joy, even though you see trouble and trial of every kind. And you see the word trial there? It's the same word that is also translated in the New Testament, temptation. Temptation. You know what the difference between a trial and a temptation is? The devil tempts you so you will fail. God tests you so you will succeed. So have you ever thought about the fact that what you're going through right now is actually God making you better? You say, it sure doesn't feel like that. I know. That's why it's a test. It seems as if we're being torn down. God says, no, I'm building you up. How? By by testing your faith. Look at verse 2. For you know that the testing of your faith. So immediately, James moves, and he's only in verse 2. He immediately moves from trials and difficulties and challenges to the explanation. He puts your trouble and your trial under a microscope, and he says, if you look closer, it's counterintuitive, but it is actually God working to strengthen your faith. You say, where do you get this? Right there. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness he immediately shows us that our troubles and our trials and our challenges and our difficulties and the opposition we feel and the headwinds that are blowing against us and the what feels like a setback to us is actually God working through our spiritual lives to to improve us spiritually by testing our faith Amen. This just is counterintuitive. 
So what kind of faith, what kind of joy do we find when we're going through all kinds of troubles? Well, first of all, there's the joy of investigated faith. The joy of investigated faith. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at the Bible. In verse 2, the Bible says, when you meet trials of various kinds, verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith produces steadfast, steadfastness. How many of you, when you were in school, man, you couldn't wait for the test? <laughs> and how many of you, your favorite day in college was when the professor came in and said, put all your books down and in Maybe in somebody's case, put your phones away. That didn't happen. When I was in college, nobody worried about anybody's phone, right? Our phones were hanging on the wall, and you had to put a quarter in them, right? But how many of you know that your favorite day in college was the day the professor walks in, announces the class, put your books down, take out a piece of paper. We're having a pop quiz. You remember what that is? You didn't know it was coming. How many of you know life feels like a pop quiz some days? There are seasons in life where everything seems to be riding high and all of a sudden it's test day. Anybody in here have that recurring nightmare where you show up to class and you didn't even know you were in the class and it's final exam day? How many of you had that recurring nightmare? One of the most common nightmares in America. Usually you're in your underwear in that uh, dream, but nevertheless, that's another story. We can talk about it during counseling, but <laughs> what is the deal? Do you like tests? Well, some of us do, but most of us look back on them uh, or look at them now as a, a time of dread. But I like this statement that I heard years ago, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted look what the bible says when you're going through trials you know trouble difficulty challenges how many of you are going through anything that would look like that raise your hand if you're going through trials i want to make sure i'm talking to the right some of you say no i'm not going through anything how many of you wouldn't raise your hand in church if they were giving away money for it let me see your <laughs> amen it's okay don't raise one now. You'll be raising both of them and you get to heaven. That's another story. <laughs> you with me, Alan? Count it all joys when you meet trials, troubles, difficulties, challenges of various kinds, for you know that really what you're experiencing are not trials and difficulties and problems that are just meaningless, but they're actually the testing of your faith. It is God investigating whether or not your faith is strong. And, 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 and you and I can do this for ourselves. I want you to think about this. Think about your Christian life. And think about things that you have failed over and over and over again. You know what's happening? You're being tested. And let me tell you how many times you're going to be tested. Till you pass. And then you move on to harder tests. You say, Pastor, you're really cheering me up. Well, let me ask you a question. If God is not in your troubles, where are you? If God doesn't have a plan for the troubles you're going through, what is the meaning of your life? If God is not somewhere in all of your difficulties making you better, please explain to me what your life really means. There's a joy in an investigated faith. James says, count it all joy. Consider it an opportunity to rejoice in the Lord because your troubles are not meaningless difficulties sent to make your life a living terror. 
Your difficulties and your problems and your challenges are actually your sovereign God at work in your life to bring about strength in you. He is testing you. He's evaluating you. Amen. Testing makes you better. Y'all remember having to take a driver's test? I love a driver's test, right? I took it when I was 15. Now, the thing interesting about a driving test, they never asked me, how did you get ready for a driving test since you don't have a driver's license? You don't have a learner's permit. How did you get ready for this test? It's assumed that you've been driving even though you're not supposed to. That's a whole other story. I'm not a, I'm not a politician. I don't make the laws, right? But you go in for a driving test, and, you know, I was 15 or whatever it was, trying to get my permit or my license or whatever it was, and guess what? They make you do all kinds of weird things. They test how well you stop and the parallel parking and all that. You remember? And did you put your blinker on in time? And there's a guy sitting next to you, uh, you know, like with a clipboard in my, in my driver's test. There's a clipboard probably now. That guy's just looking at his Apple Watch. I don't know got an iPad I don't know but while you're trying to drive you're 15 or 16 years old you know you're going to make mistakes you've been making plenty of them while you've been getting ready to drive you're trying to get that driver's license right it's a rite of passage the all-important driver's license and you got a guy there checking off boxes to see how you're doing did you brake smoothly did you turn you know uh, too quickly did you put your blinker on in enough time I mean there's nothing like driving you crazy and making you a nervous wreck because someone is what investigating and evaluating and while that is a nerve-wracking experience is anybody here glad that the other 10,000 cars that you're driving next to on Mopac have at least had a driver's test at one point in their life? Aren't you glad that somebody got tested? Testing is no fun for you, but thank God that everybody else is going through it. Why? Because we know, the Bible says, that testing is a good thing. Testing evaluates whether or not we're getting better, whether or not we're succeeding, whether or not we can move on and to maturity into our Christian life. Because every single challenge in life, every single difficulty in life, listen, even the ones you bring upon yourself, God is in the middle of every one of them testing you and testing your faith so that something can be produced in you that will make you a more like Christ in this world. It's the, and so in the middle of it all, you say, I choose joy in the middle of this. In the middle of poverty, I choose joy. In the middle of uh, health challenges, I choose joy. In the middle of family crisis, I'm going to find my joy in the middle of it all. It doesn't mean we're ignoring the problems. It doesn't mean we're running for cover. It doesn't mean that we are uh, believe in some kind of uh, escapism. No. We're facing the trouble head on, but we're facing it not with dismay, not with uh, a kind of fatalism, not with the idea that all of this is meaningless, you know, a tale told by an idiot full of fury signifying nothing. No, we're choosing joy. That God has a plan. And I'm trusting God. And the fire I'm going through will not burn me. And the, the waters overwhelming, it will not, overwhelming me will not drown me. And the walls closing in all around me will not crush me. Because in the middle of it all, I'm trusting in the Lord. And I'm finding the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's the joy of investigated faith. Hey, listen, if you're going through some tough times right now, hey, praise God, God is testing you. You've done well, you've studied. He's moving you on to the next level. And then there's the joy of not only in investigating, uh, investigated faith, but improving faith. The joy of improving faith. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at verse 3 again. 
For you know that the testing of your, faith, of your faith produces steadfastness. In other words, think about it. All the challenges the world is going through right now, the financial challenges. I have a little app on my phone, you know, and over all my years in the ministry, I've been putting a little bit away, you know, for that day when, you know, I need it. And I have a little app on my phone that keeps track of it. And I sure hate looking at that app these days. And in the middle of it all, when you go to the grocery store and the price of everything you, go, you want has gone up. And you go to the gas station and you fill up your tank and you go, I didn't want to fill up both of my cars. One filling up my wife and my car, just mine. What's this all about? I'm going to have to get a part-time job to fill up my tank. And you've got problems in your personal life and problems in your professional life and problems that nobody even knows about. And, and then on top of it, you worry about what hadn't happened yet. <laughs> Amen. Because you say, man, this is it's going from dark to darker around here. You know what the Bible says? God is doing something. He's producing something. Look at the word. Your faith produces steadfastness. That word produces, uh, we, get, we get our word energy from that word. There's something happening. There's something moving forward. There's something driving us toward a finish line and toward a victory even though it feels like we're going backwards, even though it feels like we're under unbelievable stress, even though it feels like, you know, we're losing, the Bible says, no, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We're actually being propelled forward through the middle of all of our challenges. And what are we, what, what, are, what is all this producing? What, what, is, what is all the, 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 the reality of a bad economy, the, the reality of, 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 of the inability of young people to find a home or a place to live without spending their whole paycheck on rent, the inability for families to be able to make it without nearly running out of money before they run out of month, what in the world can the Christian expect through all of that? The Bible calls it steadfastness steadfastness I heard about a guy driving down the road one day and he saw a little boy standing out in the barn lot with an old sway back horse he's brushing his horse that old horse will sway back horse he got stopped and looked he said hey boy can that horse run fast that boy was combing his horse and he said no but he can stand fast Through all your problems, you may not be running fast, but you can stand fast. The word steadfastness uh, literally is the is two Greek words, under and to remain, to remain under. That means the ability to get up under somewhere and just stay right there till the storm passes by. Steadfastness. I'm not going anywhere. These challenges are not greater than my God. These difficulties are not greater than my faith. No matter what comes my way, I'm staying, standing steadfast. I'm remaining under. Now, you know we got cats at our house, right? We have this little zoo, you know. The dog has cancer. One cat has diabetes. The other got thyroid problems. I'm like a vet now, you know. Didn't want to be a vet, but I am. So, you know, the cats don't get along. They don't, got two male cats. One of them would like to be friends. The other one's like, it ain't happening. So we can't keep them in the same room at the same time. So they're on a schedule. So one of them comes out, the other one has to go in. So when it's time to put the one up while the other one can come out and rule the house for that moment, for those few hours, the one that has to be put up, he tells time. He knows what's happening because he goes up under the couch or somewhere and he won't come out. 
you got to get down and drag him out. He's up under something where he's safe. That's exactly, literally what the word steadfast means. Under, remaining under. You go to get that cat, he just goes up under something, you can't reach him. He's under it and he's staying there. Hey, listen, what are you getting up under? When the storms of life come and the challenges of life come and the difficulties of life come and hey, they're here. <laughs> they're not coming, they're here. What are you going to run up under and stay there during the hurricane of trouble? You come up under the lordship of Jesus Christ and say, I'm staying right here. I'm staying with God. My faith has found a resting place. Steadfast. It means to remain, to stay steady, to not be moved by the troubles and the challenges and the difficulties. <laughs> Amen, pastor, you're preaching it. <laughs> Amen. And let me tell you something. How long does this last, Pastor? Till you get to heaven. You say, come on, man, don't tell me that. I know, I know. You come here, you get the truth. I mean, I, it's tough, but, you know. And it's making you better. Now, I know that nobody here is a basketball fan. I get that. Everybody here loves football. I get that. But I'm an NBA fan, and it's the NBA Finals, and I'm a Warriors fan. I love the Warriors. And it was looking grim the other night, boy. They were down, you know, it was two to one. My guys were down, and they were going to Boston, one of the toughest places to play. Boston was up, and it's tough. And oh man, our guys are struggling till Steph Curry comes out with that phenomenal touch he has, raining threes from everywhere. I mean, this guy scored 43 points, put the whole team on his back, just carried him on to victory. Now it's tied up two to two. They're going back this time to California. We'll see how Monday looks. We got the home court advantage. All of a sudden, we got a series. Because why? Because this little dude that's only six, two and a half, he's only an inch taller than I am. And he looks like a little bitty kid out there with all these giants he's playing against and he'll be right across half court, and he'll throw a ball, and they're knocking him down. He's already hit the floor. and Boy, that swish right through the net. He hits that three. Greatest three-point shooter in the history of the game. Every game, he breaks another NBA record with the number of threes he puts up. Even when they lose, he has a phenomenal game. Why is he able to do it? I think he's full of the Holy Spirit, but what's the real practical reason God's got to be with it one way or another what is the practical reason that a guy can put up that many three balls in a game I mean why can't everybody do that he hits three he, listen he takes 300 shots every single day after practice during the season and in the off season he takes 500 shots every single day it is estimated that since his, college, since his high school days, between practice and games, he has made one million three-point shots. So with that much practice, I got a lot of confidence that he's going to hit a three Monday night when he gets on his own home court and it is a make or break kind of a game. I got confidence in this boy that he's going to make a three-point shot when he gets that game. Why? Because he's already made a million before. He has practiced so much that his, his success is almost <laughs> inevitable. You know why you're going through what you're going through? It's just practice. God is just letting you go through some practice because God is making you so much better through it all. You are being 
Something is being produced in you and the practice of challenges and the practice of difficulty and the practice of, of the hassles you're going through and you just keep expressing your faith and you just keep finding your joy and you just keep on trusting the Lord through it all. The Bible says as a result, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You are getting better through it all. Would you stand with me all over this place? Father, in the name of Jesus, do something right now that really makes a mark on our spiritual lives. As we come together, let's sing and let's rejoice in the Lord. If you're not a member of the church yet, man, today be a great day for you to step out, come to one of our pastors and me and say, you know, I'd like to join this church. You come right now out of the balcony off the lower floor. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, what we're talking about today only makes sense if you've got a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, if you want to experience joy in the midst of trouble, you've got to have a personal relationship with Christ. We want to explain to you in just a few moments how you can have that personal relationship with the Lord. Here's what I'm asking you to do. In just a moment, we're going to start to sing. I'm going to be standing right down here. Other pastors are already down here to help you. All you have to do is come to me or one of these and say, I want to follow Jesus. Come on right now as we sing. We'll wait for you right here. Come on right now. Come on. He's all I need. He's all. and a couple of things real quickly. Tonight is Lord's Supper. Deacons will be meeting at 5 o'clock this evening, getting ready for the 6 o'clock Lord's Supper. We had announced that we would be having a brief church conference, but due to things we couldn't control, we're having to postpone the church conference until later in the summer. We'll give you updates on that as we know a little closer to the time when we'll be having the church conference. Uh, also, next Sunday is Dad's Day, right? And we're going to have a special guest, Ronnie Hill. All the guys are going to love Ronnie. When this guy's not preaching, he's rodeoing, fishing, hunting. He's a cool guy. Plus, every guy 12 years old and up gets a free bottle of barbecue sauce at church. Now, you cannot beat that. So dads and all men from 12 years old and up, let's all be together next Sunday for Dad's Day, all right? Mickey, will you dismiss us in prayer? Let's pray together. And Lord, it's great to be in your house for this service again today. Lord, I thank you for speaking so uh, well. Lord, I pray that as we, Father, go to our classes uh, Lord, that you teach us something more and give us fellowship with each other. Father, I pray that as we go about this city, as we leave, Lord, you let us be salt and light. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I pray that the message, the worship, the music, I pray that it was all a blessing to you and a strengthening to you. And we're going to continue this series, getting through what you're going through, for several more weeks. Now, next week, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, Ronnie Hill, Dr. Ronnie Hill, a uh, fantastic communicator of the gospel, he'll be here on Dad's Day, Father's Day. I don't want you to miss it. Also, every dad who shows up, in fact, every guy 
from the age of 12 on up is going to get a free bottle of barbecue sauce. And it's the good stuff from the uh, Elgin uh, uh, Sausage Company out in Elgin. So it's good, and uh, we don't want you to miss it. So that's next Sunday. If the service today touched you in any way, we want to be a blessing to you. Let us know uh, by emailing us at info, I-N-F-O, at hpbc.org. Let us know how we can minister to you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying God's blessings on you. We've got resources to help you grow. Just reach out to us at info at hpbc.org. Let us know how we can minister to you. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.